Good morning, everyone. Um, and on behalf of SAMSO Insights, I'd like to welcome to you to the UWA Club on this wonderful spring morning, notwithstanding all the rain and the wind that we're experiencing. Um, it's my good fortune to be uh, talking with three people here. Uh, from my right, I've got Matt Bowen and I've got Adele Vandervelt, who are both from Jackson McDonald. Matt is one of Australia's leading commercial lawyers in the area of energy law. Um, and to the, to the far right here, I've got a chap by the name of Joe Wider. And Joe, you're from the Department of Mines, Industry Regulation and Safety, which includes energy policy. Uh, and the beauty of having Joe along this morning is it's going to be on the back of uh, a very good and helpful announcement from, from government that will make it easier for our, our mining uh, companies. Now the main topic of conversation is decarbonisation and we're doing that from, and the reason why we've got people from Jackson McDonald along is that we're, we're looking at the legal framework that is needed to take things forward. Uh, we're at the, the blunt end of converting people away from uh, fossil fuels in particular and predominantly moving on to hybrid power setups. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot involved in that, not just from technology, but how do you handle that from that legal perspective? Um, and that's a, that's a very, a very, very interesting topic. Decarbonisation is, is a big deal. And I know most of you have, have, have get that. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that this is happening. I attended a, a, a conference last week on new metals. New metals predominantly being those uh, relating to battery technology. Um, so we're talking about things such as obviously lithium, but lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, vanadium, and rare earths. Uh, rare earths was particularly important with respect to things such as wind turbines. Um, so with, with that in mind, we'll be moving forward. We'll be handling this with two main chunks, uh, initially talking about the, the decarbonisation aspects and the legal framework, uh, and then Joe will come in to talk about uh, matters that will assist miners uh, to be able to handle it. He's, he is genuinely here, uh, the, the old saying is he's from the government, and he is here to help, and that is uh, legitimately the case. But Joe will talk more on that later. Okay, thank you. That brings us round to the main topic of conversation, which is all around decarbonisation. And uh, for most of you are, are aware of this. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion uh, pitched at various levels. But as I've said earlier, it is now getting towards the blunt end and we're talking about implementation. And how does that look and how do you do it? Um, again, at a macro level, the world economy is setting about transferring itself to a carbon-free uh, future and environment. And that includes the WA economy and the mining sector as a part of that. In fact, the mining sector here in WA is pivotal, pivotal. Uh, all of the um, crucial metals involved are available here in Western Australia. Not only is it, uh, are we talking about all the critical minerals and the rare earths, but also um, when you're looking Further down the track, but it's already underway, we're talking about a green, the green hydrogen um, uh, energy sector, which is, again, absolutely crucial. We have oodles of uh, opportunities for, for solar, hydrogen, wind, and through to the metals that are going into batteries and appliances uh, everywhere, which is part of de decarbonisation. Couldn't be a better place on the planet to be than here in Western Australia. It is so exciting. And uh, I referenced earlier the New Metals Conference. There was a buzz there. There was an absolute buzz. Um, you're talking about some hardcore business people, but they understand that this is such a, a pivotal moment in history. And the revolution that we're going through, uh, started probably in the late 20th century, will be, will be analogous to the Industrial Revolution. That's, that's how big of a deal it is. I get quite passionate about it. Um, if you're talking about hardcore business people, I, my favourite part of the conference, apart from just talking with the people and getting the, the, the stories behind their, their enterprises, 
was uh, an early presentation. It was a presentation by Eddie Rigg, who's the executive chairman of Argonaut, the stockbroking and, and finance uh, firm. Um, he was really uh, thoughtful um, about the implications and uh, about the opportunities that have come out of that. And a lot of interesting material I pulled out of um, as his presentation. Um, just to talk about how things are going through so much change, one of the, the slides shown was the ASX 300 top 10 performers this year. And if you look at that and you factor in the impact of the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war, it's no surprise that you've still got some old world commodities in there as big performers. So you have uh, Whitehaven Coal, a New Hope Corporation, big coal uh, companies, and you have the oil and gas companies performing well. But half of that top 10 is actually these, uh, the, the, the new metals. So your lithium, uranium is in there, and um, the copper nickel plays are in there. So they are actually now performing really well. So the, the transition is happening, it's underway, it is effective, it makes good business sense. So it's not, it's not um, a pie in the sky, let's all hold hands and sing kumbaya. This is the reality, this is the reality. Uh, so I'll, I'll drop it down now and, and, and talk to Matt and Adele about how do you implement that reality against that, that backdrop. Um, so coming back to the focus on the keyword of decarbonisation, uh, the, the big question would be to start at the top is why do we decarbonise? Sure, Th thanks Tony. Um, I'll make the observation that it is truly an extraordinary time, I think, that we are living in at the moment. Um, there's a lot that's going to change. And I think the whole decarbonisation message um, for companies, uh, whether you're large company, small company, it's going to affect everyone. Um, and there's going to be pressure from various directions for businesses to decarbonise. So the question why decarbonise, I suppose there's a few dimensions to it. Um, there's going to be pressure from, from customers and your contractors down the supply chain, um, regardless of what type of business you're in and even more in mining. Um, there's going to be pressure from your, from your stakeholders and your shareholders and I think that's filters through into um, what board's responsibilities are going to be and governance wise, how, how are they setting targets, how are they disclosing against what they're doing, are they truly doing what they're saying they're doing, there's going to be more regulation and there's been already been some um, articles in the newspaper about ASIC looking at you know greenwashing and what does that mean? Are people really doing what they say they're doing? Um, but ultimately, I think for businesses, it's really about working out um, what are your drivers and doing it the right way because it's the right thing to do and that's a way of doing business. And I think that's that's what we all think it's going to become. Um, and you know, regulation-wise, I mean, Matt, Matt and I can talk a bit about that. There's there's laws that that needs to be changed. There's targets that government's going to set, and there's going to be immense pressure. We think it's going to um, translate into quite um, stringent reporting obligations and requirements. And unless everyone who's part of the chain um, and the cycle of, of your business, unless everyone's reporting in a consistent way, it's very difficult to measure um, what people are actually achieving. Um, so we think it's all around us. We think everyone is going to have to think about it. The, the big question is just, I think, for people to work out where do they start? I think that's the thing mm. that we've been looking at as lawyers as well to try and work out how can we assist our clients to work out what is the first step? Because if you're a large company, you might have internal resources that might help you um, to develop strategies. And in, even that's been um, challenging in the last few years. I mean, we've certainly worked with some clients who's had excellent people in-house. Traditionally, the mining companies wouldn't necessarily have people with the skills um, to deal with renewables, hybrids, that type of technology. Um, that's probably moved on a bit by now. But if you're a smaller player, I think it's really difficult to work out um, but there's certainly a lot of people out there that's there to help that's very knowledgeable from a technical and engineering perspective and then um, what we do is we, we we try and assist our clients to find legal solutions whether it's documented or sitting outside of contracts um, and to just be aware of what the regulatory trends are and where do you position yourself in that and where, where to start I think is is the big question hmm. for anyone yeah look good goody I, th I think that's right I think um, what we've seen happen in just a few years, in a very few years, 
is decarbonisation has moved from something that was a combination of over the horizon somewhere and it just sat in your corporate social responsibility space to something that is at the heart of the business. And um, as, as Adele says, for everyone in the sector, whether you're a, a miner, a small miner, a mid-cap miner, a large miner, um, whether you're a Met sector participant, um, this is going to disrupt your business. So it's a matter of um, understanding really not only your own drivers, what's causing you to move, whether it's your own aspirations or your shareholders or your financiers or your insurers, um, or it's your customers. So if you're a contractor to a mining company and that mining company is setting itself or having put upon it carbon targets, that's going to impact the services that you provide to them. And they're going to want to reflect that in the contracts they enter into with you. And so you're going to need to have your own position clear about how you're going to respond when your customers come to you and say, where do you fit into my decarbonisation strategy? Yes. So it's you, you, they don't want to be looking at blank faces. Huh? That's exactly What's all right. That about? No. That's exactly right. And and the earlier they go down the path of of determining how this is going to uh, be implemented, yes, the better. And that yes. certainly involves getting good uh, legal input from from people mm. that know what what the implications are. Which brings us round to um, ha what is what is the decarbonisation involved? Now, um, I've known Matt for a long time, and I can tell you that. Um, he, he's certainly a lawyer by trade, but he's also very much a frustrated engineer. This is true. Now, we, we, we <laughs> very true. And, and if we weren't very too careful, he could spend an hour telling us how to put together a power station. I'd love to. Just, just no. Okay. The answer is no, Matt. We spoke about this beforehand. Sorry. But um, it, 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 it's, uh, Matt brings that kind of uh, it's a unique talent because he does uh, genuinely understand technology and engineering requirements. But it's, of course, he's able to provide the, uh, the, the legal framework that you need to, to, to hang these things off and knows what's involved. And we'll, I'll ask him more about that um, in, in, in a couple of seconds. Just also, you may have noted that there's a bit of an accent coming from Adele. Um, I apologise for that. She is from South Africa. Um, but on the upside, how are the Springboks performing at Dell? <laughs> Very to... good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Tony, we good. agreed that we weren't going to mention the Springboks. <laughs> we, we did. So you chose your timing very well. <laughs> <laughs> they I, are I just wanted to lift her spirits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, but on that note, what is interesting, I might just spend a minute on that. Um, before I moved to Australia, we went through a whole regime change in South Africa with regulation. And it's, it's absolutely incredible how that changes how people do business. And I think although decarbonisation is a global trend, it's not so much a, a regional or country specific thing. Um, I'm feeling really excited about this because I think it creates opportunities. It creates opportunity for investment. Um, it creates opportunity for restructuring of companies, forming mm. of new strategies, alliances. Um, and it covers, you know, everyone in resources, oil and gas companies, mining companies, service providers. So, yeah, it's a very exciting time. So, um, yeah. It, it, it is, Adele. Uh, um, and, I mean, all of us here have genuine enthusiasm about this. Um, I'll give Matt, though, an opportunity now in particular to talk about um, how, how does decarbonisation look at yes. a practical level. Yes, look, I, I, I will do. And you've given me an opportunity to talk about engineering, which was um, risky. Uh, but you could edit out most of it. Um, but just before I do, I just want to pick up on what Adele said. Um, I said that the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Another part of that change is decarbonisation, um, responding to your carbon emissions, is rapidly moving from being seen as a problem and a cost to an opportunity, a business opportunity, an opportunity to innovate, um, and increasingly already today, a way to do things more cheaply. Um, so already, uh, wind and solar energy is the most, uh, is the cheapest way of getting electricity um, in terms of the long-term cost of the electricity. 
but also we are just starting to see customers differentiating in price in terms of what they're prepared to, to pay. It's not a big part of the mining sector yet, but we think it's inevitable that it will be. Within five years, you're going to be able to charge more for your product if you've got a very clear decarbonisation pathway and have already started decarbonising your product. And so there's a, not only on the cost saving, but on the revenue growing uh, kind of black letter, hardcore bottom line opportunities exist in this space. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. I, I'm just uh, expanding on that. Um, something that I'm uh, very much aware of is there's um, the, the two major forms of, of nickel uh, around the world. Um, there are nickel, nickel laterites and nickel sulphides, and it's the latter that uh, we have predominantly in Australia, and it's the latter uh, which is much friendlier for, on the environment. Um, the, the, the other nickel deposits, which are mainly in Indonesia, um, require more energy, and there's a greater difficulty in processing them, and, and also they have some uh, environmental issues, which are less with the Australian ores, the, the nickel sulphides. And it is actually the case now that they're being sought out um, for, for battery input um, with that in mind. So yes, where where business business operates as business has always done since the dawn of time, it, it, it needs to make money, but we're getting into a situation where indeed businesses can make money on the back of those sorts of things which yep. work well for the, the environment. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, what I, I think that, uh, again, uh, taking advantage of uh, the engineering uh, bent, um, I'm, I'm, I know that we've got some um, hybrid systems which are currently operating, and I thought closer to home, um, drawing from material that you put together, <laughs> you may wish to talk about yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. Yes. Um, Yes, that's right. So now let me answer the question you actually asked me. Uh, that's a, a, a very subtle hint. Yes. Thank you. Um, so um, if, we, if we talk about this, it's probably easiest to uh, talk about this from the miner's perspective yeah. or from the perspective of a mine. Um, that doesn't mean this is something that only impacts the miner. Um, it certainly affects everybody in the MET sector and a lot of our clients are METs business participants and this all ripples through. But the mining sector is about mining, so let's talk about the mine. Um, mines emit carbon really from two main sources. This is very much simplifying it. Um, they, gener they already generate electricity. Uh, mines use electricity for a range of purposes, dewatering pumps, air conditioning for underground mines. Um, uh, various uh, drive motors on conveyors and so on um, in any processing you've got on the mine site. Um, so every mine has a power station. Um, and then the other significant emitter of carbon from a mine site is the fleet. And you can divide that in two. There's the little fleet and the big fleet. The little fleet is obviously all the, the cars and four-wheel drives and so on, but also the crew transfer buses and, and sort of road going stuff. Um, and and then the big fleet is the haul packs in particular, but the other very large bits of equipment that, that, that move around on a mine site. And each of those three categories will have a different story. Mm. And there's a point that we'll, we'll circle back to um, probably a couple of times in this conversation. But the point for your listeners to bear in mind is the solution for every mine is going to be different. Yeah. There's, there's no single one-size-fits-all solution to this. There's, there's a range of tools that are available to you and the mix and match of those tools for your mine site will be different um, depending upon what you're, what you're mining, where you're located, what the resources, wind and solar resources are and so on. Um, but if we start with the power side, and we might touch on that, and then we'll, we'll circle back to that um, when we come to talk about the power purchase agreements that Joe's going to tell us about. Um, at the moment, uh, 
if you're lucky enough to be near a gas pipeline, your mine site might run on gas, otherwise it runs on diesel. So to decarbonise your electricity supply, you need to put in uh, probably a combination of wind and solar, uh, and then um, because uh, you know, the wind doesn't always blow, sun does not shine at night, um, you need to have uh, some form of electricity storage to store up the renewable energy when it's available and release it when it's not. Uh, so you need a battery or there are other forms of storage depending upon where you are. Um, there's a project over east at the moment uh, that's experimenting with pumped hydro between two abandoned mine pits. Uh, pump the electricity, pump the water up the hill using spare electricity, let it run down the hill and generate hydroelectricity when you need to get it back. Um, so whether that works for your mine site depends a lot on the geology. Yep. So they've tried that in abandoned coal mines and find that the, uh, the water tends to dissolve the mud rock that the coal was sitting in and yeah. the whole thing literally collapses. Um, but so you'll need a form of storage. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about perhaps the detail when we come to the power purchase agreements and the little schematics you've, you've, uh, you've waved at me. <laughs> um, and let's talk just a little bit about, about the, rest of, the rest of the mine. Yep. Uh, one of the first points to make is, although mines use electricity now, as we move down the line of decarbonize, of getting the diesel out of mine sites, yep. they can use a lot more electricity. So if you're a mine that needs 10 or 20 megawatts of electricity now, you're going to need uh, 30 or 40 or 50 megawatts of electricity uh, later on. So not only do you need to replace your power station, you actually need to make it twice the size or possibly more. Um, there are already solutions out there in various stages of evolution, but on the near term horizon to address the small vehicle fleet battery electric vehicles, um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, where you capture your renewable energy and convert it into hydrogen and then you use that hydrogen as a way of moving the energy from your stationary wind and solar farm to your mobile fleet. Um, there's solutions already available for cars, buses um, and emerging for the four-wheel drive fleet. The big bits of kit, the fun bits, the Tonka trucks, um, is is a longer story, but it's not as far away as it was a couple of years ago. Yes. So Komatsu and Caterpillar are racing to get products online. They've got trial uh, rigs on the go around the world. Um, Anglo Gold in Africa, uh, I can't remember whether they're Komatsu or Caterpillar. Mm. So I'll start that sentence again. There are already rigs um, out there around the world being tested on mine sites that are uh, either battery or hydrogen fuel cell or both. Um, um, there's a group of NASA rocket scientists, no less, yeah. um, who uh, were involved in developing the NASA rovers uh, who have set themselves up uh, huh. to solve the power supply for haul packs. Uh, so Caterpillar and Komatsu now find themselves competing with NASA rocket scientists. That's that's a fantastic story. Isn't that's it? actually very Isn't exciting. Yeah. Um, and and the thing is, all of these big, really big rigs, they're already electric. So a haul pack is diesel electric. The diesel motor generates electricity, and electric motors drive the wheels. So you you just need to replace the diesel engine. Matt, is it, is it um, I mean, it's, 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 it's always difficult to read the tea leaves and there's different options. From what I've um, seen in my research for the heavy duty stuff, it is uh, the hydrogen cells are probably going to be the end game or? Well, it's, it's really interesting. We, um, we attended uh, the Minerals Research Institute of WA's conference on net zero mining last week, um, which is where the uh, the NASA rocket scientists presented. Um, they are actually, they have a hybrid, which is a combination of fuel cell and battery. Yes. Um, you don't want just fuel cell because 
uh, they use regenerative braking. So as it's going down the decline, it will actually generate electricity uh, and, uh, and you need a battery to store that. Um, so if you just size it on batteries, you'd, well, the optimum is to have a mix of, they have found, is to have a mix of hydrogen fuel cells and batteries. One of the difficulties with hydrogen is it's not great underground. It's a, it's a very explosive gas and so... Um, and very slippery. It tends yeah. to want to get away. <laughs> it does. It's, uh, it's frisky. They're yeah. very little molecules. <laughs> they like to leak. Yeah. Um, so uh, it remains to be seen whether we get a viable solution underground yeah. using hydrogen. Um, but then, then you start... You need to start thinking about your mine design differently. So for Greenfields sites, uh, this is a golden opportunity. But even for existing mines, uh, the way you run your mine might change because we've we designed the mines the way we do because we use a particular sort of fuel, diesel. It's portable. It's convenient. It's fantastic. It's liquid at room temperature. What more could you ask? Um, so for underground mines, there's there's a thought that instead of having the haul packs grinding up the decline, and it could be a 40, 45 minute drive on a deep mine. You might have the haul packs drive horizontally, which uses a whole lot less power, dump the ore and have a vertical hoist, which is stationary and so could be connected to the power station and you don't need to use the batteries to run it. So, in fact, we might travel back 100 years in mining technology <laughs> and go back to the headers, lifting the ore. Um, so, everyone's mine will be different and there'll be a mix of different solutions for everybody else. No, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, and so, and again, I think we, we circle back to the word of opportunities, which are just, there's tremendous opportunities out there. Mm. And the technology is doing all sorts of things. I mean, there's um, changes afoot with regards to battery chemistry. Um, yes. There are some issues, of course, with, with, with lithium batteries, particularly operating in high temperature environments. Mm. So a mix that uh, changes that um, and diminishes the, the um, fire slash explosion potential um, is is on the horizon and and there are various things um, that will that will be brought to bear on on these issues i will and i know we want to do to talk about power purchase agreements um, but just um, if you can run with me matt i wanted to mention too that you're on the um, a hydrogen a state government hydrogen committee mm. and could you just a couple of comments about that and what you're doing and what that's looking at yes sure um, happy to. So, um, to her credit, Alana McTiernan um, identified renewable hydrogen as a as a possible opportunity for the state very early, um, and started getting her department thinking about this five or six years ago. Now, the long game for Western Australia is um, that in twenty or thirty years, our LNG export business is largely going to evaporate because customers are not going to want to buy it um, and what's what's the state's export revenue to replace that uh, one of the big opportunities that Western Australia's got um, is to export green hydrogen that is hydrogen made using renewable energy to electrolyze water um, and uh, as uh, Alan Finkel, the then chief scientist, said uh, you're basically exporting sunshine. Um, so for our traditional energy markets uh, and other energy markets that don't have the same resources in terms of the quality of the wind and the solar resource, and we've got the world's best in Western Australia of both, um, often co-located, um, but also um, it, we've, got, we've got the space now, tenure for large uh, hybrid or wind and solar projects is not easy, but we do at least have, have the land to put them on. Um, and so um, we can capture the energy from the sun and from the wind, convert it to hydrogen and export that hydrogen to new markets. And so... Um, Alana McTiernan formed the Renewable Hydrogen Council, which is a 
group of industry participants to advise her in relation to this. Um, and um, we've, we've worked with the Minister to help her develop the state's renewable hydrogen policy. Um, after the last election, she w became our first hydrogen minister. Um, and really, her department is uh, looking at helping develop, ultimately, an export hydrogen industry in Western Australia. But as a step along the road to that, and also for use locally, particularly on mine sites, um, a domestic renewable hydrogen uh, industry, because hydrogen is, is not so much useful as itself, although it is used as an industrial feedstock, it's a way of storing energy and transporting energy. So I'm getting sun and wind when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, and I want to use it somewhere else, either just down the road in a mobile vehicle or across the world, or I want to use it at a different time. So hydrogen is one of the ways of storing renewable energy. The round trip conversion efficiency is not great, which affects the capital cost, so it's not, it's not kind of quite there yet. But this is getting moving cheaper there. and cheaper and cheaper and every year. And, and it isn't an extraordinary. If we'd said uh, even uh, as recently as 10 years ago that we'll end up having a, a state minister for hydrogen, they would have said you're, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're smoking some bad things or mm. whatever. So, I mean, that's... If, yeah. I, I think if you'd said five years ago that wind and solar were going to be cheaper yeah. than yeah. installed yeah. diesel... Um, everybody would have called you a mad dreamer. Yeah. yeah, that's the rate of change. And that's why earlier on, I, I actually used the word revolution deliberately and not just evolution. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's, it, it's just great. And as ever, I come back to another key word, which is opportunity. So, so when we're talking about um, electrolyzers to, to produce the hydrogen, to split water up, with electrolyzers, there are, again, um, uh, crucial minerals involved there, generally speaking, things like um, platinum and palladium group, for example, but there are others too. Some old age metals still have uh, uh, in really important roles. Many of them have very important roles. And I'll come back to, to iron, because I, I, I want you to talk about the infrastructure requirements, and so there's implications for iron. Also, in a smaller degree, there's other things like silver, which can be used um, for, for, for solar cells um, and other applications. So again, the, the opportunities are, are there. Um, I did say we would get down to the more prosaic matter of the uh, purchasing agreements, the purchase agreements. Um, now, I want everybody to stay with me, and I'm going to reward you after that with a joke. Now, I only know about five jokes. This is, Matt knows this to be true. And unfortunately, he probably knows the one that I'm going to mention because it, uh, it includes um, lawyers. So that's a reward. Not so much of a reward for Matt and Adele, but we will get there. Um, so let, <laughs> having said that, let's give you an opportunity to talk about that. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think a good starting point is probably um, also just um, being conscious of the fact that the listeners may not be people with legal background or they might be people who have negotiated contracts before, maybe even um, power purchase agreements. Um, but at its heart, I think um, the way we, we like to, to introduce a power purchase agreement and the whole hybrid model behind it is to make a few remarks about the fact that it's really a risk, it can be a very useful risk management tool. Um, I think Templates as such or precedents that you have can be extremely helpful, um, but it needs to be used with a lot of caution. And, and it's precisely because of this, because every project or contractual relationship between parties will have different risks involved. Um, and they all need to balance in a certain to be balanced up in a certain way. And for every risk there will be a response. And the response could be in the contract itself by way of remedies or incentives, or it could be commercial, operational, or it could be technical and finding solutions outside of the agreement. At the end of the day, I think um, everyone wants a balanced agreement. You want something that you can take through a couple of years, through a healthy relationship, and that's even more critical now when you consider the 
the, the pace at which technology is changing. And if there's a more efficient way to do it three years down the track, you want to be able to have that good relationship with your party, with your partner and contractor to say, let's investigate how we can do this for our joint benefit. Um, so if you've got a contract that's not balanced at all, I think you're going to really struggle at that point. So I think that that's a very important observation mm. to make. Okay, well, look, thanks very much. Uh, that was terrific stuff from Matt and Adele. So what I want to do now is, is shift our uh, attention to uh, our other special guest, Joe Wider, from the government, um, where the, the concentration is about the renewable power purchase agreements and the recent initiative that Joe's going to talk about from the department. Um, Joe, could you just fill us in about that, probably perhaps giving us a, a quick overview of, of the, your role and the, and the department and then bringing in the uh, initiative and so on. Yeah, good morning, Tony, and thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Joe Wider. I manage the Energy Industry Development Team at Energy Policy WA, which is part of the Department of Mines. Um, we are a new team that has been established to work with local industries to support the mining sector on its decarbonisation journey. Um, we were established late last year um, and since our establishment we've been consulting with the mining sector about what the barriers are um, and we've also been talking to the local manufacturers about what the barriers and opportunities are for them in um, facilitating projects in the mining sector. Um, so there's, there's a, a, a range of barriers that um, people identify um, and I'm sure your listeners are well aware of the challenges in attracting skilled staff. Um, there's also issues to do with land access and the approvals process um, and the time it takes for approvals. Um, but one of the barriers that some of the miners identified was the initial capital costs of doing renewable energy projects because you're basically buying 25 years worth of fuel on day one, so they tend to have high capex. Um, and so one way of overcoming that barrier is by um, engaging with an independent power producer so that they incur the capital costs and you sign a power purchase agreement with them to pay off those capital costs over time. Um, and some of the, the small to mid-tier miners that we spoke to, they appeared to but not have an awareness, well they have an awareness of the option but they just weren't fully across how to go and implement it. So one of the first um, work activities the Energy Industry Development Team did was to procure some legal consultants to come up with a power purchase agreement guide and a template. Um, and this is specifically targeting the small to medium scale miners in the West Australian off-grid space. And so we were pleased to launch these two products at the Merowa conference. Um, and so these are available from the Energy Policy WA website. Um, and I encourage listeners to download them and um, send any feedback to me. Um, and we're also interested in feedback about what our next work activities can be to help the local manufacturing sector as well as the mining sector in this um, decarbonisation journey. Oh, Joe, th thanks very much. I, I, I know that the, the small medium miners will be delighted to have heard that. Um, as I said earlier, they are at the that the implementation stage. These we're no longer talking pie in the sky. We're talking with these miners who've who've have done the research. They've done the, the the geo work. They've located the resources. They're gearing up for production, and they know they've got to factor this stuff into it. And they don't have their own large in-house resources to draw from. Um, the capital issue is a is a big issue, and anything that the government can do to support the process is extremely welcome um, and it's, the whole thing has been taken very seriously it's, a, it's an important aspect and they're looking for guidance so it's great to know that um, this level of support is, is, is available. Um, did you want to mention any of the resources that perhaps uh, some of our audience could look at you know, with yeah, online well, and so on? In, in addition to the, the Power Purses Agreement Guide We've also published a fact sheet on greenhouse gas emissions in the mineral sector of Western Australia. Um, and that obviously shows that gold and iron ore are some of the big sectors, but it is also interesting how big the battery metals sector is and how quickly we're seeing new projects in that space. Um, and so we also have produced a case study 
on the goldfields um, projects because they are best practice at the moment. But um, I'm really pleased to hear that Western Australia is soon going to be getting some engine off projects in Western Australia. So Liontown Lithium announced this morning that they are doing a renewable energy project with um, Zenith Energy, who are an independent power producer. Um, and that system is going to be designed from day one to be op able to operate in engine off mode, which basically means that the wind and the solar and the battery are carrying the 100% of the load as well as the spinning reserve requirements. Um, and obviously, if the wind dies down, the battery has to carry the load for a while until the fossil fuel generators kick back in to carry through. So it'll be really interesting to see what annual renewable energy fraction they're achieving, but I know other miners are also looking at the diesel off option. No, that, it, that's, all, that's good news all round actually, Joe. Um, really appreciate you coming in today, and I know that our audience will be very pleased as well. Uh, and um, I'm sure if there's anybody out there who are getting to that stage and they want to know more, then please, um, make contact with Joe and, his, and the department and they are only too willing to assist. So thanks once again Joe, much appreciated. Yep, and just Google Energy Policy WA and you should be able to find the template, the guide um, and the fact sheet and the case study. So thank you Tony. Um, I think it's uh, important to note of course and it's part of the reason why, why you're here and why we're with Joe as well is that you're the guys that actually put together the, the templates so the, the power agreements are your babies, um, and in that context, if you could perhaps expand on, on that. Mm, sure. And um, before, before we brought Joe in, um, Adele had made the point about it's important to try to have a balanced agreement. And um, the point I want to make about that is when you're contracting for a power supply on a remote mine site, and you're adopting the independent power provider model, as Joe has described, to solve that capital investment problem for the miner by having the power provider do the capital investment and then recover its investment over the life of the contract. The two parties need each other. And the contract has to reflect the fact that as various issues arrive, arise throughout the life of the project and throughout the life of the contract, Terminating the contract is not an option for either party. The, the miner needs power. Um, it's no good sitting there feeling that you've won a great contractual argument in the dark. Uh, the power provider needs the revenue to recover the capital they've invested in building the power station. So you actually have to approach the contract on the basis that it's going to have to work in the long term that termination is really not a, as an option for either party. And so part of what you have to do in the contract is have machinery to um, deal with problems as they arise and to preserve the relationship. As Adele was saying, um, this has to be a collaborative relationship between the miner and the power provider uh, as you adapt to changing circumstances and not, a, not an adversarial relationship. Yeah, and, and I think um, what, what I'll add to that is when you look at the contract and certainly in the, in the projects that we've worked on, we've certainly done it from a miners perspective, we've done it from a developer or IPP's perspective. And um, you, you sort of first off face with the question, do I need two contracts or one? Because what's, what's happening here is it's not your conventional PPA, here you go, I supply electricity, you buy it. You actually have this construction element to it. And um, it's an ongoing challenge to simplify that so that it not, doesn't turn into a <laughs> traditional construction contract with all the complexities. But you still do need it in there. And there's a lot of discussion around oversight and control over the construction phase and that part. Um, and, and, you know, the contrast can reflect that to a certain degree. Um, but it's all, it, it's the, the integration of those aspects and whether you structurally put it in one agreement or two. Um, we've, we've done either either me method um, and, and both works um, but it's important to actually turn your mind to that at the start and as well at the time where you start considering what the risks are what are the potential responses um, so the template and guide um, or the template itself is primarily designed um, as Joe said uh, for off-grid off remote mines there are some optional clauses for grid 
connected generation located at the site. Um, but the template is very basic. It's simple and it's just a start. So when we put it together, we consciously try to make it simple because you cannot jump into the complexities of all the integration of all the technology interfaces, the timing issues for a Brownfields project, for example, where your existing supply needs to end and you need to figure out when your new supply is going to start. But it's dependent on construction concepts and potential delays that could be beyond both parties' control. For example, supply issues um, due to COVID, for example, that, that, that caused a lot of issues um, recently for many people, not only in this context, but in supply contracts. So it's very much standing back from it and having a look. If there's certain types of things happening, what do we think is going to be the best um, response to that? And which party is best placed to manage it? and which party is in the best position to bear the loss as well, because then you start talking about insurance. Um, but, you know, we, we sort of divvy it up between um, allowances in the contract, let's say for a construction term during construction phase, allow for certain delays to be excusable, force majeure as the obvious example, supply chain issues. But at the end of the day, it's not good enough to just say, oh no, the contractor's excused to perform because there's a delay. So what's the consequence? You need to really step it down through the practical steps to work out where does the loss eventually um, fall. Um, and then that would also impact on how you balance other risks in the agreement. But we found, I think in all the cases, that um, the, biggest, um, the biggest sort of consideration in it all is to how do you actually structure it to incentivize compliance, performance, optimization. Mm. Um, because if you just put penalties in that or liquidated damages, you know, it's only going to get you that far. And, and that's why I think my comment initially around having a good relationship you know, there's, you can work in optimization, efficiency targets. There's, there's risks around data, wind data, solar data, who's going to carry that risk. It's all um, the parties who are needing to work together to actually work out how they manage that. Um, but delay in the construction phase, that's probably the main the issue that you spend a lot yeah. of time on and thinking about. The, then you the, go the, the issue with, um, at the moment, that we're grappling with is simple uh, supply of labour. Yes. Um, and and yes. I imagine that comes into play. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, okay. and so I might, uh, just to kind of pick up on that, on that and give an, give an example. Um, so Joe mentioned the, um, the uh, Goldfields uh, Agnew mine site. Um, Adele and I had the fun of working for Goldfields um, on putting the contracts together for that. Um, there we wound up doing two separate agreements, the power purchase agreement and before that the development agreement. Um, but as Adele says, you can combine the two together, there are pros and cons. But those contracts uh, were, were complex and there was, altogether there was a couple of hundred pages of contract document. Um, whereas the template that um, the state government is making available, that Joe is making available, um, We've got about 40 pages of power purchase agreement. Now, it's not just because Adele and I are brilliantly efficient, and it's not just because we're brilliantly efficient and lead authors. Um, it, that's right. It, another reason is all the stuff we left out. And this, this template is aimed to be a starting point for a small to mid renewable project. But a lot of the stuff that we've left out is all of the machinery that, that you get in a full-blown construction contract to deal with delay and cost changes. And in fact, delay changes causing cost changes. So you have contractor cause delays, principal cause delays, and independent delays, third-party delays, force majeure. But what happens if the contractor, what happens if a principal cause delay coincides with a contractor cause delay. Do they or don't they get excuses? And this is the sort of thing that keeps our construction law colleagues happily engaged from you know, year to year. So a, a, an important point for your listeners is the more you legislate for those things in your agreement, the longer the agreement gets, and hence, the more you pay, the more you pay your lawyers, the more uh, relationship capital you spend negotiating it with the other side. But perhaps, if those things go wrong, 
you're glad you've got the machinery to deal with it rather than having to figure it out at the time. So for both parties, for the power provider and the miner, it's going to be a personal risk management decision about how much do I want to legislate and how much do I want to leave out and we'll sort it out at the time. Uh, and that, that's, that's one of the ways you can keep your agreement at a manageable size. Yeah, and I must say we did in the guide, it contains some optional clauses, variations. We make a lot of commentary, commentary around you could consider this or you may want to think about X, Y, Z. Mm. Um, so it does go into a bit more detail where we share that experience um, that we've obtained through working on these contracts. Um, so it's extremely helpful to read them together. Um, and you know, it's a, good, it's a good building block. But if you overlap your risk analysis with your risk events and your potential responses with the template, it's an incredibly helpful mm. starting point and um, it will get you quite far. Um, I think the risk is sometimes people just want to jump into the agreements but don't really step back and think, you know, as lawyers, we just draft because we get the instructions to do stuff. We try and <laughs> push it back and say, look, can we be involved earlier on? So I suppose there is benefit in, in particular with these hybrid agreements and the in integration issues um, that an earlier conversation with, with your in-house legal and you're bringing your technical, your legal and your commercial people together early on to make sure that you actually achieve the type of contract that you want to be in. Oh, look, the, the message is coming through here loud and clear that um, even notwithstanding if you use a template, each situation uh, has its own peculiarities. And I've actually been thinking along those lines as we were talking. I've been thinking about um, the impacts and uh, opportunities for Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. So all, nearly all of these mines are in remote areas. Uh, Nearly all of them have impacts with uh, Indigenous communities and, and involve some agreements in the, in the initial phase. But then subsequent to that, um, I, my understanding is that there are some hybrid system providers who are, who are very desirous of working closely with Indigenous communities from, mm -hmm. from two perspectives. One is to provide employment opportunities, so the construction and maintenance of those systems. And two, and probably applies more to those hybrid systems which also have a connection or a pathway to connect to the grid where there are op commercial opportunities from providing excess power from yes. the systems. Mm. Yes. Are, yeah, is it? Ab absolutely. And, um, and so one of the, the, there's several ways in which a hybrid renewable power station, that is a power station that's got a mix of wind, solar, battery, um, other components as well um, differs from your conventional diesel project. Um, diesel gen sets are an extremely mature technology. You whack a diesel tank there, uh, you, you drop a diesel generator off the back of a truck, uh, you plug the two together and you plug it into your mine site and away you go. And you need about as much area as a tennis court to put it on um, and you're done. Um, a renewable power station is a much more sophisticated beast, um, which actually means you have to think about managing it differently and you have to think about integrating it with your mine operations. But one of the ways in which it's different is it's bigger physically. So the footprint that you need for a solar farm is a lot larger than the footprint for a diesel um, power station or a gas power station. And the footprint for a wind farm is bigger again. Um, one of the major challenges for hybrid renewable power in Western Australia at the moment at scale is getting the right tenure. Um, if you're a miner, it's easier because minerals tenements can be used to do this, but all of your land access issues will arise in respect of this, which ties in directly, of course, with engagement with the local traditional owners. And, and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing agreements that, that are starting to bring the traditional owners into the process both earlier and in a more integrated manner. Um, and there's, you know, there's certainly, uh, so we did a, it wasn't a mining project, but uh, we did a project with Indigenous Business Australia to build a grid connected solar farm up near Northam um, where uh, the Indigenous community are actually co-owners and co-operators of the facility. Oh, that, that's a great outcome. Yeah. Absolutely. Very win-win. Yeah. And I think, I think the jury's out a bit, I must say, um, 
I mean, I've, I've been in the work practicing in Australia for 12 plus years now. And, um, you know, I'm still waiting for my chance to actually, you know, unlock that potential that Australian companies actually have. And I think this, in this renewable space and the hydrogen space is the perfect opportunity yes. to bring people in. You know, yes, you can create employment opportunities, education. You don't actually have exactly. to do that much. You just need to give people exposure to what, what it's like to run a commercial enterprise. And it could be aspects of it. I mean, we did, we did heaps of that in South Africa. You bring people in, yeah. um, yes, community projects, but you bring them in on an equity basis. Yep. You, you give them a board role, you know, even observer role to learn, you know, all those skills. It's mm. a fantastic opportunity, especially for newer projects. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited. Like, I'm really hoping that there would be opportunities for companies to do that the right way because we've certainly seen Australian companies yeah. doing it who's the investing in mining projects in Africa so why not do it on your own doorstep with natural resources that are actually closely collected to the land and to the people um, so so that's something I think that there's ample of opportunity Absolutely. for and um, yeah, I'd, be love, I'd love to get involved in something like yeah. that because it's been a few years since I've done that um, and there's you know I think sort of that one other observation I'll make that's not sort of indigenous specific but on the on the mining company structurally side with the IPP relationship yes um, I mean one one thing that Matt and I've been discussing have been you know structurally you know you think it makes sense if you talk about a mine's power supply um, it's a long-term contract it's driving your performance of your mine like shouldn't the mining companies be taking ownership or equity in the power yes. SPV that might develop the project? Because at, at this stage, most of the models we've seen is just contracted to a contractor, build and yeah. operate, and you either have to purchase it or you build it for the miner. Um, but it's interesting, and I think as we move into the opportunities for optimization and where companies would have the desire to actually have more control over that yes. decarbonization message and what they implement, um, we'd be very interested to see mm. what's happening uh, Adele, I don't doubt that uh, that you're in the right place at the right time, and I, I, knowing both of you, um, I know that you take social responsibilities very seriously. Uh, you're not you're not just uh, talking about it; you you are walking the walk. So, yeah, I congratulate you for for entering that space, and I know that you will do it very very well. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that. Um, We've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, holding out uh, the promise of giving you a joke, which I will get to. But before I do that, I want to be able to give uh, you guys an opportunity to provide any final comments or thoughts. And then I'm going to hit you with a joke. And then I'm going to run away as quickly as I can. Um, look, up, I might go first. And Tony, you waved at me your little yes. bit of paper. So let me hold, hold this up for the camera. Um, so, uh, for any of your viewers that uh, want to see what a, uh, what a um, hybrid power station might look like, uh, there's actually a couple of websites that we'll be able to provide, you'll be able to provide the links to these. Um, uh, King Island um, in the Bass Strait and Rot our very own Rotnest Island uh, both have a hybrid renewable power station and you can actually go online and see them in real time. And for nerds like me, I'm surprised I do anything else. Because you can actually see the, the wind picks up and the diesel plant drops away and, and you can see the load and everything flowing in real time. But the reason, the reason that we, we sort of put this slide up when we talk about this subject is it's actually a helpful way for both the miners and anyone in the MET sector just to get a feel for what we're really talking about when we're talking about a hybrid power supply for a mine site. So I've now addressed your little bit of paper. Um, closing remarks. Um, I think I'll circle right back to where we started and say this, this is a transition that is, that is happening. Um, the train has left the station. It is underway. Um, and it is an, an enormous challenge, a, a kind of once in a century transition that's happening in the energy sector and the mining sector but coupled with it is enormous opportunity um, we are going to be able to do things better and more cheaply in a decarbonized world than in the old carbon intensive world that that we live with and so this decade is going to see 
billions of dollars spent. The, the forecast for Western Australia in the mining sector is somewhere between sort of 20 and 50 billion dollars. So if you're in the Met sector, this is a mining boom that's going to be of a scale with the China-driven mining boom of a decade ago. Um, and it's replete with opportunities for everybody throughout the supply chain. Look, uh, well said, and I, I, I echo this, the sentiments. I genuinely appreciate your time today. Um, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, but when you draw it back to the big picture that Matt just put there, I just think that what a wonderful time to be alive and here in Western Australia. So really m much obliged to you. And I, I now have to sit in, fit in my little joke at your expense. But bear in mind I've said some nice words about you. Okay, now, what is the difference, <clears throat> what is the difference between a lawyer and a sperm? No, you don't know. The answer is, well, at least a sperm has a one in a million chance of becoming a human being. Boom, boom. <laughs> On that frivolous and silly note, I'll, I'll, I'll close and end the session. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>